Good morning. This is the second Sunday in Advent, and this is a service of morning prayer. Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Prepare ye the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Let us humbly confess our sins unto Almighty God. Almighty and most merciful Father, we have erred and strayed from thy ways like lost sheep. We have followed too much the devices and desires of our own hearts. We have offended against thy holy laws. We have left undone those things which we ought to have done, and we have done those things which we ought not to have done. And there is no health in us. But thou, O Lord, have mercy upon us, miserable offenders. Spare thou those, O God, who confess their faults. Restore thou those who are penitent, according to thy promises declared unto mankind in Christ Jesus our Lord. And grant, O most merciful Father, for his sake, that we may hereafter live a godly, righteous, and sober life. To the glory of thy holy name. Amen. Almighty God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who desireth not the death of a sinner, but rather that he may turn from his wickedness and live, hath given power and commandment to his ministers, to declare and pronounce to his people being penitent the absolution and remission of their sins. He pardoneth and absolveth all those who truly repent and unfeignedly believe his holy gospel. Wherefore, let us beseech him to grant us true repentance and his Holy Spirit, that those things may please him which we do at this present, and that the rest of our lives hereafter may be pure and holy, so that at the last we may come to his eternal joy through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. O Lord, open thou our lips, and our mouth shall show forth thy praise. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Praise ye the Lord. The Lord's name be praised. The Venite with the Advent Antiphon. Our King and Savior draweth nigh, O come, let us adore him. O come, let us sing unto the Lord. Let us heartily rejoice in the strength of our salvation. Let us come before his presence with thanksgiving, and show ourselves glad in him with psalms. For the Lord is a great God, and a great King above all gods. In his hand are all the corners of the earth, and the strength of the hills is his also. The sea is his, and he made it, and his hands prepared the dry land. O come, let us worship and fall down, and kneel before the Lord our Maker. For he is the Lord our God, and we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. O worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. Let the whole earth stand in awe of him. For he cometh, for he cometh to judge the earth, and with righteousness to judge the world and the peoples with his truth. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Ghost as it was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Our psalm this morning is number 119, verses 1 through 16. Mm-hmm. Blessed are those that are undefiled in the way, and walk in the law of the Lord. Blessed are they that keep his testimonies, and seek him with their whole heart. Even they who do no wickedness, and walk in his ways, thou hast charged that we shall diligently keep thy commandments. 
Oh, that my ways were made so direct, that I might keep thy statutes. So shall I not be confounded, while I have respect unto all thy commandments. I will thank thee with an unfeigned heart, when I shall have learned the judgments of thy righteousness. I will keep thy statutes, O oh, forsake me not utterly. Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way, even by ruling himself after thy word? With my whole heart have I sought thee, O oh, let me go, not go wrong out of thy commandments. Thy word have I hid within my heart, that I should not sin against thee. Blessed art thou, O Lord, O oh, teach me thy statutes. With my lips have I been telling of all the judgments of thy mouth. I have had as great a delight in the way of thy testimonies as in all manner of riches. I will talk of thy commandments and have respect unto thy ways. My delight shall be in thy statutes, and I will not forget thy word. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Here we begin at the 55th chapter of the book of the prophet Isaiah. Ho, every one that thirsteth, come ye to the waters, and he that hath no money, come ye, buy and eat. Yea, come, buy wine and milk without money and without price. Wherefore do ye spend money for that which is not bread, and your labor for that which satisfieth not? Hearken diligently unto me, and eat ye that which is good, and let your soul delight itself in fatness. Incline your ear and come unto me, hear and your soul shall live, and I will make an everlasting covenant with you, even the sure mercies of David. Behold, I have given him for a witness to the people, a leader and commander to the people. Behold, thou shalt call a nation that thou knowest not, and nations that know not thee shall run unto thee because of the Lord thy God, and for the Holy One of Israel, for he hath glorified thee. Seek ye the Lord while he may be found, Call ye upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his ways, and the unrighteous man his thoughts. And let him return unto the Lord, and he will have mercy upon him. And to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, saith the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. For as the rain cometh down, and as the snow from heaven, and returneth not thither, but watereth the earth, and maketh it bring forth and bud, that ye may give seed to the sower, and bread to the eater. So shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth. It shall not return unto me void, but it shall accomplish that which I please, and it shall prosper in the thing whereunto I send it. For ye shall go out with joy, and be led forth with peace. The mountains and the hills shall break forth before you into singing, and all the trees of the field shall clap their hands. Instead of the thorn shall come up the fir tree, instead of the briar shall come up the myrtle tree, and it shall be to the Lord for a name, for an everlasting sign that shall not be cut off. Here endeth the first lesson. The Benedictus says, Domine, page 11. <laughs> Blessed art thou, O Lord God of our fathers, praised and exalted above all forever. Blessed art thou for the name of thy majesty, praised and exalted above all forever. Blessed art thou in the temple of thy holiness, praised and exalted above all forever. Blessed art thou that beholdest the depths and dwellest between the cherubim. 
praised and exalted above all forever. Blessed art thou on the glorious throne of thy kingdom, praised and exalted above all forever. Blessed art thou in the firmament of heaven, praised and exalted above all forever. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Here begin at the fourth verse of the 15th chapter of the Epistle of St. Paul to the Romans. For whatever things were written aforetime were written for our learning, that through patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. Now the God of patience and consolation grant you to be like-minded one toward another, according to Christ Jesus, that ye may with one mind and one mouth glorify God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Wherefore, receive ye one another, as Christ also received us to the glory of God. Now I say that Jesus Christ was a minister of the circumcision for the truth of God, to confirm the promises made unto the fathers, and that the Gentiles might glorify God for his mercy. As it is written, For this cause I will confess to thee among the Gentiles, and sing unto thy name. And again he saith, Rejoice ye Gentiles with his people. And again, Praise the Lord, all ye Gentiles, and laud him, all ye people. And again, Isaiah saith, There shall be a root of Jesse, and he that shall rise to reign over the Gentiles, in him shall the Gentiles trust. Now the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing, that ye may abound in hope through the power of the Holy Ghost. Here endeth the second lesson. The Benedictus Dominus Deus. Mm -hmm. Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he hath visited and redeemed his people, and hath raised up a mighty salvation for us in the house of his servant David, as he spake by the mouth of his holy prophets, which have been since the world began that we should be saved from our enemies and from the hand of all that hate us, to perform the mercy promised to our forefathers and to remember his holy covenant, to perform the oath which he swore to our forefather Abraham that he would give us, that we, being delivered out of the hand of our enemies, might serve him without fear, in holiness and righteousness before him all the days of our life. And thou, child, shalt be called the prophet of the highest, for thou shalt go before the face of the Lord to prepare his ways, to give knowledge of salvation unto his people for the remission of their sins. Through the tender mercy of our God, whereby the day spring from on high hath visited us, to give light to them that sit in darkness and in the shadow of death, and to guide our feet into the way of peace. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, 
the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. The Lord be with you and with thy spirit. Let us pray. O Lord, show thy mercy upon us and grant us thy salvation. O God, may clean our hearts within us and take not thy Holy Spirit from us. The Collect for the Second Sunday in Advent. Blessed Lord, who has caused all holy scriptures to be written for our learning, grant that we may in such wise hear them, read, mark, learn, and inwardly digest them, that by patience and comfort of thy holy word, we may embrace and ever hold fast the blessed hope of everlasting life which thou hast given to us in our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. The Advent Collect. Almighty God, give us grace that we may cast away the works of darkness and put upon us the armor of light. Now in the time of this mortal life, in which thy Son, Jesus Christ, came to visit us in great humility, that in the last day, when he shall come again in his glorious majesty to judge both the quick and the dead, we may rise to the life immortal. Through him who liveth and reigneth with thee and the Holy Ghost, now and ever. Amen. The Collects for Peace and Grace. O God, who art the author of peace and lover of concord, in knowledge of whom standeth our eternal life, whose service is perfect freedom, defend us, thy humble servants, in all assaults of our enemies, that we, surely trusting in thy defense, may not fear the power of any adversaries, through the might of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. O Lord, our Heavenly Father, almighty and everlasting God, who has safely brought us to the beginning of this day, defend us in the same with thy mighty power, and grant that this day we fall into no sin, neither run into any kind of danger, but that all our doings, being ordered by thy governance, may be righteous in thy sight. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Well, good morning. Last summer, the Anglican world and the wider evangelical world lost a giant of the faith one of the top theologians of the 20th century, my own bishop's mentor, and a strong advocate of the prayer book tradition. I'm speaking, of course, of Dr. J.I. Packer. Back in 1966, Dr. Packer wrote a little pamphlet titled The Gospel in the Prayer Book. And in this 20-page booklet, he writes about the gospel and the liturgy and the prayer book in general. And then he follows it with um, essays about the gospel in each of the services of Holy Communion, baptism, burial, marriage, and the Great Litany. The current publisher is given permission for the individual essays from the booklet to be reprinted in bulletins and other church contexts. So I'll be uh, uh, passing some of that to those of you all here in the parish um, sometime next year. Well, in his opening essay, Dr. Packer observes that the prayer book does not loom in as large in the lives of then current churchmen as it did in the time of their great grandfathers. And since this was 60 years ago, we might need to add another great, you know, the times of their great great grandfathers. <laughs> well, he writes that for for many of he writes of many of the then modern Anglicans. Their Bible study scheme, if they have one, owes nothing to the lectionary. The irony of that observation is that it was fostering regular and systematic reading and hearing of the scriptures. That was one of the main reasons, if not the main reason, Archbishop Cranmer held, uh, created the original Book of Common Prayer in the first place. And indeed, Cranmer held this out to be the ancient practice of the church. So in his preface to the first book of Common Prayer, Archbishop Cranmer writes this. For they so ordered the matter that all the whole Bible, or the greatest part thereof, should be read over once in the year, intending thereby that the clergy, and especially such as were ministers of the congregation, should, by often reading and meditation of God's word, 
be stirred up to godliness themselves and be more able to exhort others by wholesome doctrine and to confute them that were adversaries to the truth. And further, that the people, by daily hearing of the Holy Scripture read in the church, should continually profit more and more in the knowledge of God and be the more inflamed with the love of his true religion. This idea that we should profit more and more in the knowledge of God, that's a good aim at any time of the year. But today's collect makes it especially a focus of the Advent season. And indeed, today's collect sometimes gives the second Sunday in Advent the nickname of Bible study. So this is what we prayed. Blessed Lord, who has caused all Holy Scripture to be written for our learning, grant that we may in such wise hear them, read, mark, learn, and inwardly digest them, that by patience and comfort of thy holy word, we may embrace and ever hold fast the blessed hope of everlasting life, which thou hast given us in our Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. So notice how the Collect ties our use of Scripture not only to learning about God, but also to embracing and holding fast the hope of everlasting life. In the Bible, we find the words of everlasting life. This is why it's so important for Christians to spend time in the word often and regularly. Because we have the scriptures, we don't have to wonder about what God thinks. We have his word. It's through the Bible that he speaks to us. If we want to hear from God, we must go to the scriptures. The uh, catechism called To Be a Christian, which Dr. Packer helped to write toward the end of his life, it riffs off of our collect to explain the way we approach uh, scripture in order to hear from God and in order to grow in the faith. So like all catechisms, this is in a question and answer format. So the first question is, how should the Holy Scripture shape your daily life? Answer, I should hear them, read, mark, learn, and inwardly digest them, that by the sustaining power of God's word I may grow in grace and hold fast to the hope given to me in Jesus Christ. Next question, how should you hear the Bible? Answer, I should hear the Bible through regularly participation in the church's worship, in which I join in reciting scripture, hear it read and prayed, and listen to its truth proclaimed. So hearing the scripture read is a significant part of Christian worship. Even when we gather for Holy Communion, hearing and proclaiming the scriptures is an essential element of our worship. In fact, liturgical scholars uh, generally identify Christian worship as consisting of a twofold movement. We have the liturgy of the word and the liturgy of the table. This, of course, is most obvious in our lessons and psalms and morning and evening prayer, and in our epistle and gospel at communion. But even in the rest of the liturgy, scripture is consistently alluded to and quoted. Take, for example, the prayer of humble access, which alludes to both the centurion's prayer and the prayer of the Canaanite woman when they both encounter Jesus. Or we have our Alleluia and introit verses at communion, which typically come from the Psalms. We also have the Lord, Lord's Prayer in just about every service. We have the Decalogue. We have the Summary of the Law, all of which are direct quotations from Scripture. And while I have not done the math on this myself, I have heard several people say that the prayer book is about 80 to 90 percent Scripture quotations and Scripture allusions. Let's go on to the next question of the Catechism. How should you read the Bible? Answer. I should read the Bible daily following the church's set readings, lectionaries, or following a pattern of my own choosing. So the church has two main lectionaries. It has the daily office lectionary and the Eucharistic lectionary. The Eucharistic lectionary is topical based on the church year, and it's assigned to each Sunday and holy day, traditionally only consisting of an epistle and a gospel. These readings then form a foundation of texts that we hear read and preached upon year after year. So after three or four years of simply attending church, again, we have an epistle, we have a gospel in in the classical prayer book tradition, you do get to know these core texts very well, and that's a benefit of that old traditional lectionary. 
But we also have the daily office lectionary, and that consists of an Old Testament lesson, a New Testament lesson, and then a selection of psalms that, that are read in the context of morning and evening prayer. And this really is the heart of the prayer book's approach to scripture. This is what Archbishop Cranmer was talking about in his preface. Now, historically, the Psalter was recited through every month. You had a 30-day cycle, while the vast majority of the Bible, the rest of the Bible, was systematically covered each year, and the readings were assigned to the normal civil calendar rather than the church calendar. So you end up having the same reading. It's always Genesis 1 for your first morning lesson on January 1st, for example. Now, for my money, this is still the best way to approach the daily offices because it is so systematic. Now, the lectionary you'll find in, in our prayer book, our 1928 prayer book, is a revision from 1945. These readings are significantly shorter. They're tied to the church year, and they tend to be much less systematic. So, for example, our lectionary begins, um, the 1945 lectionary begins Advent with Mark's Gospel, as the second lesson for morning prayer, but it stops three weeks later after chapter five, and it doesn't get back to chapter six until Septuagesima, until pre-Lent. We're talking weeks and weeks and weeks later. This approach tends to frustrate and discourage me, but admittedly others do find its attachment to the church year to be very helpful, even though it doesn't cover as much of the scriptures, nor does it do it as systematically. I've also, from time to time, just read my own readings for the offices, taking a chapter or two for each lesson, starting with Genesis in the Old Testament, starting with Matthew in the New Testament. And again, the Bible will be read in a year if you do it this way. The main issue, regardless of how you do things, is to read the Bible. A mere 15 minutes per day will indeed get you through the entire Bible each year. Now, about three years ago, I ran across an infographic from the Bible publisher Crossway, and I've shared this with you all before, but I just can't help but share it on Advent 2. The, the post from Crossway showed how much time is needed to e read each book of the Bible. It was kind of a list, an infographic. And it puts into perspective the fact that we can indeed read more of the Bible than we often think. So listen to some of these statistics. The average time needed to read a book of the Old Testament, the whole book of the Old Testament, is 41 minutes. Only five books in the Old Testament take more than three hours to read, and none of them take more than four. That means you could read any book of the Bible in the time it takes to watch some of the biggest superhero movies that have come out in the last few years. 20 of the 39 books of the Old Testament take less than an hour to read. 14 of them take less than half an hour to read. And for the New Testament, things are even easier. Only the Gospels, Acts, and Revelation take more than an hour to read. None of the books of the Bible take more of the New Testament take more than two and a half hours. So that means that there is no book in the entire New Testament that is longer than a typical trip to the movies and dinner. 17 of the 27 books in the New Testament take less than half an hour to read, and 12 take less than 15 minutes. Then for the entire Bible, the average time it takes to read a book of the entire Bible is one hour and eight minutes. So that's about two episodes of your favorite TV program. And so I give this by way of encouragement not to be a guilt trip, um, we can all, what this tells us, we can all take up and read as St. Augustine was told at his conversion. And I'll put a link to this in the, um, in the video and on our Facebook page. The next question, how should you mark passages of scripture? Answer, I should study the Bible attentively, noting key verses and themes as well as the connections between passages in the Old and New Testaments. I should study on my own and with other Christians, using trustworthy commentaries and other resources to grasp the full meaning of God's word. So this gets us a little bit deeper than mere reading because you're drawing connections from passage to passage. Uh, sometimes you might have a Bible with cross-references and it can help with this. 
But really, familiarity is, is the most helpful thing. The more you read, the more these connections jump out at you. You just make these connections as you read the scriptures. Study with other Christians is very helpful. We have several ongoing studies here at the parish. Commentaries can also be helpful, but make sure that they're trustworthy commentaries. There's a lot of commentaries, not all of them are great. <laughs> and if you're not sure, ask one of the clergy, ask one of the Bible teachers. Most importantly, remember that scripture is the best interpreter of scripture. If you've come across a difficult part of the Bible, find an easier part that addresses the same issue. Uh, there, there's a, a homily called A Fruitful Exhortation to the Reading and Knowledge of the Holy Scripture. This is from the, from the first book of homilies. It addresses the reality of the Bible containing both difficult and easy parts. It says, He that is so weak that he is not able to brook strong meat, yet he may suck the sweet and tender milk, and defer the rest until he wax stronger and come to more knowledge. So in other words, it's always acceptable to start with the easy parts of scripture and work your way up to the harder parts. Don't do like I did as a kid and start with Revelation. That's one of the harder parts. <laughs> Next question from the Catechism. How should you learn the Bible? Answer, I should seek to know the whole sweep of scripture and to memorize key passages for my own spiritual growth and for sharing with others. So this speaks to the benefit of having the big picture approach to the Bible. Knowing the overarching story helps us to learn the details. It helps us to share the details too, helps us to share the message of scripture. The most important part of the big picture is to remember that all of the Bible is ultimately about Jesus. Remember when he was talking to those two disciples on the road to Emmaus and he explained all the scriptures, all the prophets and the law were about him. Or to quote the subtitle of my favorite children's Bible, every story whispers his name. In today's second lesson, the epistle, St. Paul wrote, whatever things were written aforetime were written for our learning, that we, through patience and comfort of the scriptures, might have hope. Sometimes seeing that sweep is difficult, that big picture but you can always ask yourself a few questions when you're really trying to learn the passage. So first, ask yourself, what does this say in context? Don't take verses out of context. We don't have soundbite uh, approach to scriptures. That's an irresponsible way of learning the scriptures. Second question to ask yourself, how does this rate relate to the rest of the specific book? Again, not just that immediate context, but the whole book. Third question, how does this relate to the rest of the Bible? We do see this as a coherent single story. Even though it's a collection of books, it's a collection that is telling one big story. Also ask yourself, what does this tell me about Jesus? Again, that's the most important interpretive thing is how does this relate to Jesus? But also let's apply it. Ask yourself, what does this tell me about my responsibility to God and my responsibility to my neighbor? Also, what does this tell me about what God has done for me and what God has done for my neighbor? Answering these questions will get you pretty far if you're trying to learn the scripture. Let's go on to the next one in the, uh, the, the final question in the catechism here. How should you inwardly digest scripture? Answer, I should meditate on scripture and let it shape my thoughts and prayers. As I absorb scripture, it deepens my knowledge of God, becomes the lens through which I understand my life and the world around me, and guides my attitudes and actions. This may be the deepest level of all. This is where scripture just gets up in you, as we say in the South. Or to borrow another cliche, you are what you eat. So have a steady diet of scripture. So on the one hand, inwardly digesting scripture does require ruminating on it, cogitating and, and, and meditating on what you've read. On the other hand, a good part of inwardly digesting scripture simply happens from repeated exposure. Using the monthly psalm cycle, I see this happening all the time for me. 
In fact, because I tend to chant through the Psalms, I hear that tune in my head as well as the text itself, and it just pops out when it's needed. <laughs> this is another one of those areas where the benefits of the traditional Eucharistic lectionary, that one year lectionary that just has an epistle and a gospel, it comes into play. Because these core texts that we get year after year, they do indeed shape us. And ultimately, this inward digesting of scripture is how we get to know God best. We pray to him and he speaks to us through his word. The better we know his word, the better we'll know him. Indeed, God has given us the scriptures so that we will not be like sheep without a shepherd. We don't have to wonder if there's some secret knowledge or code out there that is keeping us from hearing from God. We have his very words. We have the words of everlasting life. As the fruitful exhortation from the book of homilies says, these books therefore ought to be much in our hands, in our eyes, in our ears, in our mouths, but most of all in our hearts. For the scripture of God is the heavenly meat of our souls. The hearing and keeping of it maketh us blessed, sanctifieth us, and maketh us holy. It turneth our souls. It is a light lantern to our feet. It is a sure, steadfast, and everlasting instrument of our salvation. It giveth wisdom to the humble and lowly hearted. It comforteth, maketh glad, cheereth, and cherisheth our consciences. It is, more ex it is a more excellent jewel or treasure than any gold or precious stone. It is more sweet than honey or honeycomb. It is called the best part, which Mary did choose for it hath in it everlasting comfort. May we take advantage of this tremendous blessing. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. The service continues on page 18 with the state prayer. O Lord, our governor, whose glory is in all the world, we commend this nation to thy merciful care, that being guided by thy providence, we may dwell secure in thy peace. Grant to the President of the United States and to all in authority, wisdom and strength to know and do thy will. Fill them with the love of truth and righteousness and make them ever mindful of their calling to serve this people in thy fear. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who liveth and reigneth with thee in the Holy Ghost, one God, world without end, amen. Almighty and everlasting God, from whom cometh every good and perfect gift, send down upon our bishops and other clergy, and upon the congregations committed to their charge, the healthful spirit of thy grace, and that they may truly please thee, pour upon them the continual dew of thy blessing. Grant this, O Lord, for the honor of our advocate and mediator, Jesus Christ. Amen. O God, the creator and preserver of all mankind, we humbly beseech thee for all sorts and conditions of men, that thou wouldest be pleased to make thy ways known unto them, thy saving health unto all nations. More especially we pray for thy holy church universal, that it may be so guided and governed by thy good spirit, that all who profess and call themselves Christians may be led into the way of truth, and hold the faith in unity of spirit and the bond of peace and in righteousness of life. Finally, we commend to thy fatherly goodness all those who are in any ways afflicted or distressed in mind, body, or estate that it may please thee to comfort and relieve them according to their several necessities, giving them patience under their sufferings and a happy issue out of all their afflictions. And this we beg for Jesus Christ's sake. Amen. Almighty God, Father of all mercies, we thine unworthy servants do give thee most humble and hearty thanks for all thy goodness and loving kindness to us and to all men. We bless thee for our creation, preservation, and all the blessings of this life but above all for thine inestimable love and the redemption of the world by our Lord Jesus Christ, for the means of grace and for the hope of glory. And we beseech thee, give us that due sense of all thy mercies, that our hearts may be unfailingly thankful, and that we show forth thy praise, not only with our lips, but in our lives, by giving up ourselves to thy service, and by walking before thee in holiness and righteousness all our days, through Jesus Christ our Lord, to whom with thee and the Holy Ghost be all honor and glory, world without end. Amen. Almighty God, who has given us grace at this time with one accord to make our common supplications unto thee, 
and dost promise that when two or three are gathered together in thy name, thou wilt grant their requests. Fulfill now, O Lord, the desires and petitions of thy servants, as may be most expedient for them, granting us in this world knowledge of thy truth, and in the world to come, life everlasting. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Ghost be with us all evermore. Amen. <laughs>